Tonight's Bible reading comes from Joshua chapter 12. Joshua chapter 12. These are the kings of the land whom the Israelites had defeated and whose territory they took over east of the Jordan. From Arnon Gorge to Mount Hermon, including all the east side of Arabah. Sion, king of the Amorites, who reigned Heshbon, he ruled or and on the rim of Arnon Gorge. From the middle of the gorge to the Jabbok River, which is the border of the Ammonites. This included half of Gilead. He also ruled over the eastern Ar- Arabah, from the Sea of Kinnereth to the Sea of Arabah, the Salt Sea. To Beth Jesimoth, then southward uh, below the slopes of Pigsma. The territory of Og, king of Basham, one of the last of the Rephites, who reigned at Ashtaroth, uh, Edri. Um, he ruled over Mount Hermon, Salek of Basham, and to the border of the Gershur and Makbah half of Gilead to the border of the Sion, king of Heshbon. Moses, the servant of the Lord, and the Israelites conquered them. And Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave their land to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and half of the tribe of Manasseh to be their possession. These are the kings of the land that Joshua and the Israelites conquered on the west side of the Jordan, from Baal Gad in the valley of Lebanon to Mount Halak, which rises in Seir. Their lands Joshua gave as an inheritance to the tribes of Israel according to their tribal divisions. The hill country, the western foothills, the Arabah, the mountain slopes, the desert and the Negev. The lands of the Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites and Jebusites. The king of Jericho, one. The king of Ai, near Bethel, one. The king of Jerusalem, one. The king of Hebron, one. The king of Jarmuth, one. The king of Lachish, one. The king of Eglon, one. The king of Giza, one. The king of Debir, one. The king of Geder, one. The king of Hormah, one. The king of Arad, one. The king of Libna, one. The king of Admula, one. The king of Makeda, one. The king of Bethel, one. The king of Tapula, one. The king of Heper, one. The king of Aphek, one. The king of Lash Aaron, one. The king of Madden, one. The king of Hazor, one. The king of Shimron, Meron, one. The king of Ash, one. The king of Takna, one. The king of Medigo, one. The king of Kadesh, one. The king of Jochum in Carmel, one. The king of Dor in Napoth, Dor, one. The king of Giron in Gilead, one. The king of Tiraz, one. 31 kings in all. This is God's word. Well, if you're kind of like me, you, <laughs> when I opened up this text at the beginning of the week, I looked and I was scratching my head for a little while. Uh, to see where we would go uh, go tonight, but well read, uh, Jess, that was a mission. Uh, I guess it's not really the passage that you would choose uh, for a pick-me-up, kind of warm-me-up devotion, um, but I think there will be uh, some things here that we'll see basically why the author puts this here and some of the lessons we can glean from it and some of the principles that are actually very relevant uh, for New Testament believers as well. So, Before we jump in, let's uh, ask the Lord for his help and that we would have receptive hearts at this time.
Our Father, we come before you and uh, what a privilege it is to be called your people. Thank you for bringing us out tonight and uh, Lord, thank you for your precious invitation uh, to us, Lord, to be able to worship the creator of the entire universe. Uh, Lord, help us to recognize whose presence we are in uh, tonight. And Lord, as your word uh, is considered, even this difficult passage, we just pray, uh, Lord, that you would be at work in our hearts, cause us to see things here, uh, Lord, timeless truths. I pray that you would bring it home with application to our hearts. We pray that Christ, again, would be uh, who we are drawn to. And we pray, gracious God, that you would restrain Satan even this evening. We know that he, he longs in his great ministry is to snatch the word before it lands in our hearts and we pray that you would restrain him, shackle him tonight. We pray that the, uh, the Holy Spirit would triumph. And uh, we pray that uh, we would be so encouraged and so refined by your word. Speak now for your servants are listening. And we pray this in your son's name. Amen. Well, I think it's helpful just as we launch into this to consider the Bible narrative so far up to this point, well, most of it anyway, just, it might be very simple, but just to get a little bit of insight to what's going on here, way back when God promises to Abraham that he'll give him many descendants, Abraham has many descendants, ends up having many children, grandchildren, and it goes through, and that that people that come from Abraham become the nation of Israel. And then Israel becomes slaves in Egypt. And then from there, that people uh, that God promised to Abraham, they're delivered out of Egypt under Moses. And on the way to this promised land that God promised to Abraham, that he, would just, he wouldn't just give descendants, but he'd give them this land. On the way to the promised land, they're wandering for 40 years. And they're wandering and they're wandering, they're wandering. And they get to the Jordan and you'd remember that Moses, Moses dies. Joshua takes, takes the helm, as it were, and he leads the people across the Jordan. It's time for the promise to be fulfilled. They cross over the Jordan into the promised land that already has inhabitants. It's not just a, a free land here, go and take it. No, 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 there's people living there. So Israel crosses and they go and wipe out all the people there. They go and kill them. And now that land is vacant, and Israel are free to possess it. And now you see in Joshua where we're up to, that promise all the way, way back when to Abraham, that you have many descendants, and I'm going to give them this land, it's finally realized. Here it is. It's yours now. So that's where we are. So if you've trekked uh, through Joshua with us, um, we finally got to this point where the people in Canaan are wiped out and the land is there to be taken. But first here in this chapter, we get a little reminder uh, of the past prior to Joshua. Now, the bulk of this chapter, as we just read, talks about the list of people that Joshua had defeated. But the author wants to give the Israelites and the reader a little bit of a history tune-up, as it were, just, just a little refresher. Look at verse 1. These are the kings of the land whom the Israelites had defeated and whose territory they took over east of the Jordan. Now, these are the kings that they beat east of the Jordan. These are the kings they beat under Moses, not under Joshua. This was before they crossed the Jordan. And you remember, Moses was forbidden entrance into the promised land because of his sin. This little history lesson here is, this is who you beat while Moses was still your captain. Now, under Moses, they defeated two kings. You see the first one here. Look at verse 2. The first one, Sihon, the king of the Amorites. Sihon, he's the first one mentioned, and he was defeated by Moses and Israel. And if you just run your eyes over verses 2 and 3, I won't read it all, but it really shows the extent of the region that Sihon was ruler over. This is all the land that Sihon had. And this is now what Israel had come to take. Now, this is a massive amount of area. But you would rem if you would remember that battle that happened with Israel, do you remember Israel's wandering through the desert? They're trying to make their way to Canaan. And they get to this point where they can't really go around or they can't, 
They can't get there except going through Sihon's region. And so they send a message to Sihon saying, hey, can we please cross through your land on your highway? Can we, can we please do that? We promise we won't touch any food. We won't turn to the left or to the right. We won't use any of your water. We'll go straight through. The report comes back from Sihon, you're not stepping foot in here. And he sends out his army towards them to fight them. And because of his hard heart, it cost him dearly and it cost his people dearly. And, and God says to Moses, don't be afraid because I'm going to give him into your hands. You're going to defeat him. It doesn't matter how powerful he is. And Israel wipes out Sihon and all of his army and all of the people there. Wipe him out. You see, this is, this is who God is. He has them wiped out and he just gives the land over. Do you remember Psalm 24 verse 1? The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it. It belongs absolutely to him, the earth. And so God can take land from one king and one empire, as it were. He can take it off them and give it to whoever he wants. He is the landlord of the earth in the most literal sense. And he can give it to whomever he pleases it's all his. Notice the second king that they defeat under Moses. Look at verse 4. And the territory of Og, king of Bashan. Now, in, in verses 4 and 5, as you glance your eyes over it, it shows the extent of his region, and it is massive. He, 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 he had dominion over so much land, and, uh, and that's who they attack next. But notice a detail about Og. Verse 4. The territory of Og, king of Bashan, one of the last of the Rephaites. Now, who were the Rephaites? Well, we read in Scripture, these were men who were of the stock of Goliath. They were giants. They were huge. In the Greek version of the Old Testament, they're called the Titans. Absolutely massive. In Deuteronomy 3.11, the author gives us a description of King Og's bed. It says it was 13 foot long and 6 feet wide. This guy was huge. He was a giant. And this giant, as it were, is handed over to Israel. And Moses has him wiped out. And all of his people wiped out. God destroys him. Now, these great victories of Sihon and Og under Moses, they were so significant. And if you've been following us in Joshua, you would know, because you remember when Joshua first sent the spies to the first city, Jericho. Remember, they went to Rahab, and Rahab says these incredible words to the spies. Joshua 2, 10 to 11. We have heard what you did to Sihon and Og, the two kings east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted and everyone's courage failed because of you. These battles under Moses were very significant and important for what they were going to do when they crossed over, already putting fear into the people there. But it's interesting, Moses and Israel didn't just conquer that land east of the Jordan. They took it. Now look at verse 6. This is interesting. Moses, a servant of the Lord, and the Israelites conquered them. And Moses, a servant of the Lord, gave their land to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh to be their possession. Two and a half tribes out of the 12 tribes of Israel. They choose to have the land not in that main part of Canaan. Israel hasn't crossed the Jordan yet. And these, these regions that were defeated before crossing over, these two and a half tribes say, this land is really good. And it's really good for raising flocks and herds. We want this side. Now at first when Moses hears that, he's not too happy, he's not too impressed. He thinks that they might be trying to get out having to cross over the Jordan into Canaan and having to avoid all those, all those battles and all those wars. But the two and a half tribes, they come, to, they come to Moses and say, we promise when it's time to cross over the Jordan and to fight all these battles, we will go with you. We'll fight. And when the warfare's over, we'll come back and settle into this land. And Moses approves. And he gives his blessing upon them. He says, that's fine. Now, I just want to show you, we have a, we have a slide up here, just of the map, just so you can get a visual of what's uh, going on here. Now, right... Uh, Right through the, the middle here, just through the middle, underneath the Sea of Galilee, that little blue patch near the top there, that's the Sea of Galilee. As you go down, 
the dividing line between the purple on the right and the yellow on the left, Gad and West Manasseh, that's the Jordan River that runs through there. Now Moses, he, he had conquered and he'd won that right-hand side, the east. That's what, they, that's what Moses had took over. After that, after Moses dies, they cross over the Jordan to the left and all those battles that we've been reading in the book of Joshua happen on the left side of the map. So on the west, that's all the places that they conquer, all the battles that they win. So two and a half of the tribes, you'll see them East Manasseh, Gad and Reuben, all those on the east, they're the ones that said, we want to stay over here under Moses. This is the land that we want. And the other nine and a half tribes that you can see, Asher, Naphtali, Ephraim, Judah, Simeon, they were the ones that possessed, ended up possessing the land in Canaan across the Jordan. So that's what we've been reading about in Joshua. So that's just a visual to see what had happened. And so after all the battles, this is how all the land got allotted to the 12 tribes of Israel, right? So that's just helpful for a visual. Thanks, uh, Alan. Now, we need to ask the point, why does the author go into all this detail here at the start? Why does he go back and remind about uh, what Moses won and the kings that they beat? What's he doing here? Why does he give this little history recap? What really leads, this I want us to lead us into our first point this evening is the reminder of the necessity for unity. The reminder of the necessity for unity. The the author is highlighting the need for unity amongst the 12 tribes of Israel. This is what's going on here in chapter 12. Two and a half tribes are on the east, nine and a half are on the west. Israel needed to make sure that their oneness was maintained. They've got this big river that divides them, but they're one nation. They need their unity preserved. Think about it. Prior to Canaan being uh, conquered, what was Canaan like before? It had 31 cities, 31 kingdoms there that we just saw, 31 kings. It had all these different beliefs and religious practices, all these different ways. Israel couldn't function like that. God, that wasn't God's plan for Israel. They can't be like the nations. And so the author's point here that he's trying to remind them is, even though Gad, even though Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh and Reuben, even though they've settled onto the east side, it doesn't make them less Jews than the rest of Israel who cross over the Jordan. They're not some kind of subclass of Israel. And the Holy Spirit preserves this detail here for us. The need that they need to remember, they're still one. They're one people. And the Holy Spirit gives this detail over and over and over again in the New Testament for the church. Over and over again. This need for unity. When you read James, he says there must, in the church, there must be unity between the rich and the poor among you Christians. And when you read Galatians and Ephesians, there must be unity between Gentiles and Jews. Christ has made us one. And then when you read Corinthians, Paul's saying, some of you have got this spiritual gift and some of you have got this spiritual gift, but there has to be unity. There's divisions that are coming up between you. And there's this emphasis here. Unity is at the absolute heart of God's will for the church. Ephesians 4, 2-3, it's a beautiful verse. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient. Bear with one another in love and make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. It's beautiful, right? And then you read Corinthians. And in chapter 11, he says this, the same writer to Christians. Verse 18, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. You have the ideal And then you have what happens in church life. The need for unity. And we as a church, we need to be aware of this. And we need to be on guard to preserve and maximize our unity. Now, what what, what are the dangers that we got to be on guard for? One of the easiest dangers that can be to us of a church of our size is multiple services. It, It can become a danger We have many elderly who come to one of the morning services and we have many young people who come to the evening service. 
And there's a danger there of disunity, of not interacting, of not mixing, of not learning from each other, of not helping each other. And, and in, 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 a, in a real strange kind of sense, at the whole size of us as a church, it's some of us, some of us are tribes on the east side and some of us are tribes on the west side. That's almost how it, how it functions. And I mean, even as, as one of your pastors, sometimes I think, even for the evening service, there are some people in the morning service that I wish you could spend some time with, that you had fellowship with on a regular basis on a Sunday. There are some people that would be so good for you to come in contact with to build you up. And vice versa, some people in the morning, there are people here that would be so good if they were interacting with. That's something that I think about. What about also regarding, regarding this dynamic? I, many times I've I, even talking with the pastors and I've thought when we've got together, something that's been preached in the morning and I said, I really wish that people who came to the evening heard what you preached this morning. Or, or in the evening, some of the things that we've looked at in Joshua and I walk away thinking, I wish 70% of the congregation who aren't here in the evening, I wish they heard that. I really wish they did. Some are, some are going on a journey through two Thessalonians and some are going through a journey in Joshua. It'd be great if we were all doing it. And so this is something that we need to think about. How do we, how do we guard the unity of the, of the beautiful dynamics of this congregation, Castle Hill? How do we guard it and how do we maximize it? The body is most healthy when everyone is unified and walking together. This is God's will for his people. Canaan used to be many different peoples and many different, different, different people, and then God took them out and replaced them with one people. That's what he did. And, and really, this is what happens in a Christian's life in a salvation kind of sense, isn't it? Remember Galatians 3.28? There is now neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female, for you are all one in Christ. Our salvation starts that way, and as we live, we're supposed to live united. So he's reminding here of the necessity of unity. That's why he gives this little history recap. But let's look at the second point. He's reminding the forgetful to count their blessings. He's reminding the forgetful to count their blessings. So you notice here as we move to verse 7, there's a shift from Moses' conquest to Joshua's conquest. Look at verse 7 with me. Now these are the kings of the land that Joshua and the Israelites conquered on the west side of the Jordan. So we're transitioning here. This is who Joshua beat. This is what Joshua subdued. Now, verses 7 and 8 shows just the breadth of that land in the map that we saw. Look how much region they covered here. Look at verse 8. This is incredible. They, they conquered the hill country, the western foothills, the Arabah, the mountain slopes, the desert, and the Negev, the lands of the Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Huge amount of land that they conquered under Joshua. It's massive. And then... That interesting section that you get as you look at with your eyes, look at verses 9 to 24 there, and you get the list of the kings, every single king that Joshua and Israel knocked off one by one. Now, some of those, as you run your eyes over, you'll recognize the king of Jericho, the king of Ai, of Jerusalem, the five kings that hid in the cave. You'll see them there of Eglon, Giza, Debir. Um, and Bethel you have there. So some of those names you'll recognize, Machedah, that we considered. And as you look at verse 24, you get the grand tally. Uh, 31 kings in all. And, and, and look at the detail. King, one. King, one. King, one. It's a pretty repetitive list. And yet the author by the Holy Spirit takes the time to list them one by one. Why the fine details? Why, why does he go into all these fine details? When I think back over my honeymoon, it was an amazing adventure, the best, the best holiday I've ever been on. But now looking back almost seven years, I remember that it was great, but I kind of just remember it in a rough sense, in a kind of general sense, just remembering it was generally it was just a great time. Don't really remember too much, but it's when you go back and you look at the photos 
You look at the details and you remember that place you stayed at. You remember that site and that tour you went on. You remember those people that you met. You remember some of those activities that you went on. The details remind you and enlarge your appreciation of what happened because you forgot the details. Why the details here in chapter 12? It's not just page filler. God knows us too well, doesn't he? He knows that we are forgetful. He knows that we're forgetful. It's part of our fallenness. We're prone to forget what God has done and just the extent that God has done, has done it in. We forget that. For Israel, this detailed list reminds them of all the promises of God fulfilled. This detailed list shows them it wasn't just one victory. It wasn't just a couple. It was many victories. And as you look at the names, they would remember. Do you remember Jericho? He made the walls come down before we went in. Do you remember when we faced five armies at once? And we beat them. And the kings, we found them in the cave and we brought them out and we stepped on their necks. And God shows us, showed us this is what we're going to do throughout the whole land. Do you remember those battles? And the detailed list triggers off the memories, doesn't it? It shows us there is glory in the details. You see, Israel was likely to forget what God had done and we are just as vulnerable as they are to forget what God has done. You see, life gets so busy and unfortunately becomes all-consuming at times. All-consuming. And we often forget what God has done. And worse than forgetting, sometimes we're not even conscious of what God has done or what He's doing presently in our lives. We don't even recognize it when it's staring us in the face. What are some of the things they might have done? What about that wonderful opportunity that he gave you, that open door to witness to someone, to share the gospel with them, to serve someone, to, to express and to live out the love of Christ before someone? Remember that opportunity? Or what about that person that he brought into your life and they have just brought about, they've just been a messenger and a means of bringing about so much spiritual growth in your life. He brought them out of nowhere and they've been such a benefit to your soul. Or what about that sermon that you heard and God used it to turn everything around? It was as if he was only talking to you. You weren't even going to come that Sunday. And he brought you and you heard it and he hit you straight between the eyes and you needed it more than anything. What about that answered prayer that you've been praying for and the provision came like a miracle package into your life? All the things that God does Sometimes we forget, and sometimes we're not even conscious of it. The details, the details. Joshua 12 is a wonderful list that should stir up worship. It should stir up worship. Can you imagine? I just want to put you in an imaginative situation here. Imagine it was your dad or your father who was in the Israelite army that went out to fight all of these battles. Now imagine... It was your dad, right? Now imagine after he comes back from all of those battles, he's back. And then one Sunday, you go to church and Joshua 12 is read out to you. And you read this list of all the battles and all the kings and kingdoms that were defeated. You're looking and you're listening. How could you possibly find the words to express how overwhelmed you would feel? King after king, beaten. Kingdom after kingdom, conquered. And all the while, it was because God was fighting for your father. As you consider it, you look, so many battles, so many reasons your father should have died. But there was one reason he didn't, because the Lord was fighting for him and he was fighting for you. Would it not lead to worship if you heard this list read? And you would recognize that the ground before your feet, the ground that you're presently standing on, is an inheritance, a gift given by God. You're living in Canaan, and it's his gift to you. He won it for you. See, in the same way, for the Christian, Jesus has won our salvation. He fought for us, not with a sword, not with physical combat, 
But he went out, he marched out, head held high, and then he did something unexpected. He laid down his life. And he did it as a sin offering. He did it as a sin offering. The Father's love gift for humanity. The sacrifice for sinners. You see, there are so many reasons why every single person in this room should be confined to the lake of fire. But there is one reason why that doesn't have to happen, because of Jesus. Because of Jesus. You see, we need to reflect on our salvation and what Jesus has won for us in our salvation. But we also need to reflect on the daily blessings, the continual blessings, the continual kindness that he pours out on us every single day. Guys, the physical blessings, your daily bread. Why do we need to be reminded of that? It's in the Lord's Prayer. Our daily bread, the roof over your head, your job, your income, your family, life itself. These physical blessings. What about the spiritual blessings? In this corrupt and dark world, in this depressing world, Christian, you have joy. You have hope. Spiritual blessings, you've got the Word of God. And every single Sunday, you get to gather together around the Word of God. You get to gather around singing the Word. You get to gather around the Lord's Supper. You get to gather around and have fellowship with other believers who are in Christ, who are called out of this dark world just like you are. The spiritual blessings are massive. And what about the blessings of the promises of God that are fulfilled in your life every single day? promises every day that come to you that are fulfilled what about those jesus said i will never i will never leave you i will be with you till the end of the age understand there is not from the day you were saved and became a christian not one single day has he left your side your heart has wandered from him so many times he's never wandered from you he has never abandoned you what about his other promises? Philippians 1.6 He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. Are you still in the race, Christian? Are you still in the race? It's because every single day he's fulfilling that promise. Every single day he's bringing you one step closer to the heavenly city. He's keeping you there. He's keeping you in the fight. He's holding you up. He's the unseen prop every single day. Every single day. And Jesus said, my peace, I leave with you. COVID has absolutely shaken this world up. Black Lives Matter rallies, rioting, political turmoil. There's just chaos out there. People don't know what to do. And yet, Christian, you're unshaken. You have peace. You're calm on a raging sea. Why? Why? Because of the peace which surpasses all understanding in Christ Jesus. Do you understand? Every single day, there's promises being fulfilled to you. There's glory in the details. So why do we miss all of this? Why do we miss this? these blessings? Because we don't look carefully at Scripture. We don't look at it. We don't consider it. And we don't acknowledge the promises of God. God does so much. He's doing so much. But we don't often reflect and pause and think, what is he doing? And we don't record lists of blessings like we have in Joshua 12. That might be one of the reasons. Let me quote one author. He says this, quote, We should get rid of some of the tripe in our prayers like, and thank you, God, for your many, many blessings. Name one or two of the blessings instead. Why do we use such lingo ease in our prayers and worse yet, teach it to our children? End quote. We're very generic about the blessings that we receive, aren't we? Very rarely do you hear people name them one by one. And so as Christians, we fall into this depression, this melancholy. We become spiritually blue because it's as if we don't see God at work in our lives or we feel far from him. You know, Asaph in the Psalms, he felt that way. He felt spiritually blue. He felt far from God. But what did he do? What did Asaph do in Psalm 77? Let me quote what he did. Verse 10, Then I thought, to this I will appeal, 
the years when the Most High stretched out his right hand, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles long ago. I will consider all your works and I will meditate on all your mighty deeds. That's what he did. He went back to the lists. He went back to look at what God has done and he recalled them and it gave his faith strength. It lifted him up. You see, we do great good to our soul when we reflect on the promises and the blessings of God that he's fulfilled in our lives. Christian, remind yourself of Christ's victory regularly, what he won for you, and reflect on regularly the blessings that he continues to pour out on you. It will do your soul a world of good. Blessed are those as the sermon title is, who count their blessings. Blessed are those who count their blessings. And what a blessing this list in chapter 12 was to Israel. Well, let's just consider the next point here that we see something that we can glean from this passage. I want us to see a reminder here of the king who is over the 31 kings. A reminder of the king over the 31 kings. See, not only does this detailed list serve to remind us uh, of the blessings of God and his promises fulfilled, but this list, this detailed list, is a public shaming. It's a public shaming, this list, of these defeated kings. Here, really, when you look at verses 9 to 24, it's a public shaming. Here are all those who opposed God. Here they are. Have a look. Have a good look. Now, what's interesting about this is it's a glimpse. It gives us a glimpse into the future. It gives us a glimpse into a unique aspect of Jesus' death on the cross. What do I mean by that? Yes, Jesus Christ died on the cross as our substitute. He died to pay for sins and he died to reconcile us back to God when we were enemies with him. But he did something else on the cross which was monumental. Paul says it in Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. And having disarmed the spiritual powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them on the cross. He made a public spectacle of his enemies on the cross. What's Paul saying? Jesus did to Satan and the demons what Joshua did to the kings in Canaan. He publicly shamed them on the cross and he made fools of them. And so when you look at this list in Joshua 12 of these shamed and defeated kings, this is a foreshadowing of the shaming of Satan and his demons. Here, what we see, Satan's defeat is foreshadowed in Canaan. Satan's defeat is foreshadowed in the wilderness when he tried to tempt Jesus to sin, but he couldn't get him to do it. And the crushing blow of victory came upon the cross. When he stripped Satan, he crushed him, he took away his great power, and he secured the salvation of his people so that not one of them can be touched. The crushing victory, the public shaming. So Joshua 12, what you're looking at is a victory list, and the cross is a victory chart. You see, this detailed list points to the king of kings, the king over the 31, Christ. But it also points to Jesus as king over the kings in another way. Now, prior to, Is- prior to Israel conquering Canaan, Canaan had dozens of kingdoms in it, right? There were many kingdoms, 31 kingdoms in there, probably even more maybe. But when Israel went in, when God wiped them out, those kingdoms became God's kingdom and his people's kingdom. And this is a vivid picture prefiguring what happens at the end of the world. The giving over of the kingdoms to God in Joshua chapter 12 prefigures what happens at the end of the world. Listen to the similarity of the language in Revelation chapter 11. In verse 15, you have the seventh angel who blows the last trumpet. And it says this when the angel blows it. Loud voices in heaven said, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever. The kingdom of the world is given to Jesus Christ. In Joshua chapter 12, the kingdoms are given to God and his people. At the end of time, the kingdom of the world is given over to Jesus Christ. And the great resounding voices say, and he shall reign forever and ever. He is the king over the 31. 
He's the King of kings and He will reign forever and ever. He's glorious. He's glorious. R. Dodson writes this. It's beautiful. Quote, He will come to rule over creation with perfect justice. Our brothers and sisters in China, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, and countless other places will no longer be persecuted. Children will no longer be aborted. Money and coercion will be trumped by grace and truth. There'll be no more illness, no more disease, and no more death, end quote. When the kingdom of the world is given to become the kingdom of Christ. The kings and the kingdoms of Joshua 12 handed over is a glorious picture of what's to come. It's a glorious picture. It's a foretaste. And now I want us just to consider briefly our last point. Our last point. This is a reminder for us of Israel's gain becoming the Canaanites' loss. Israel's gain became the Canaanites' loss. In this passage and through Joshua, we've seen how gracious and generous God has been to his people. He has been so generous to Israel. He gives them Canaan as an inheritance. It wasn't theirs and he gave it. Remember, they were slaves for years. They were oppressed. They were downtrodden. Their children were thrown into the Nile. And he rescues them and he gives them this land all for themselves. They're given this rich land. Joshua 12 shows us the kindness and generosity of God. But it also shows us the severity of God. It also shows us the severity of God. And we see the severity of God in the Canaanites in what they lost. In what they lost, each city was destroyed one by one. One by one, everyone in there killed. These exceedingly wicked cities who were perverse, sexually perverse, who were immoral, who were pagans, who worshipped false gods, who were wicked in every kind of way, God severely, severely punished them. But God was patient for centuries. He was patient for centuries. All the way back to Abraham, he said this in chapter 15, you can't have the land yet. Why? Because your descendants will come back for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. You can't have the land yet because their sin, the people who live here, hasn't reached its full measure yet. And God was angry with these people in Canaan all the way back to Abraham's day. 600 plus years to this point, God waited patiently for this people. He was patient with his enemies for over 600 years. But what happened? Eventually, God's patience was exhausted and his patience ran out. And he punished them so severely, so severely. He had all of them killed and he took their land and gave it to another. It is a theological mistake to say that God's patience is infinite towards this world. It is theologically incorrect. His patience had run out. And Joshua 12 shows us that Israel's gain became the Canaanites' loss. It became the Canaanites' loss. And the lesson that we get here is seen in in Romans chapter 11, verse 22. Paul says, Note then the kindness and the severity of God. Note then the kindness and the severity of God. Severity to those who have fallen and kindness to you. That's exactly what's going on here. And so the lesson for us really that we see here in this final point is that the reality that the Bible teaches over and over and over again is that there are only two people. The Bible is the tale of two people. There are sheep and goats. There are wheat and tares. There are the citizens of heaven and there are those who are destined to destruction. There are those who walk the narrow way and there are those who are on the broad way that leads to destruction. There's only two groups. And what a thought. Some people who are here tonight, who are here tonight, will one day be welcomed into paradise, into the very arms of Jesus. And what a sobering thought that some in this room will exhaust the patience of God will exhaust the kindness of God. And though we may do life together, we might do our church years all together, when all is said and done, when we face judgment day, we will part ways. And some may be cast into outer darkness for all eternity. There's only ever been two people, two types of people. Note then the kindness 
and the severity of God. The kindness and the severity of God. It seems so harsh that God would have Israel wipe out all these cities, but this was God's doing. This was God's doing. And, and this reality that's going to come on the world, it should affect us. It should deeply affect us. Let me close with this quote. Rayburn writes, The kingdom of this world will become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. We must never forget this. We must never be sentimental about the world we live in. It is given over to death, whether sooner or later, everything this world does, everything it, it gives itself to worship, everything it, it accomplishes will be destroyed, and every citizen of this world will face the exacting judgment of the Lord. Now hear what he says now. Our calling is not to make this world a happier place. We may do so, as it were, by happenstance, but it's not our calling. Nor is our calling to make people feel comfortable in this world. Our calling is to call men and women, boys and girls, out of this world before it is destroyed, before it is too late. That is the Bible's perspective from beginning to end. And when we embrace that perspective and take it seriously, it changes us. It must change us. End quote. This is a reality. We're talking about your neighbor. We're talking about my family member. We're talking about your colleague talking about my teammates. We're talking about your friends. Who is the Holy Spirit prompting you tonight about? Who do you need to share the gospel with? Who do you need to call out of this world that's going to be destroyed? Who is he prompting you with? And so we see in this passage, Joshua chapter 12, it's not the passage that we choose for our morning devotion. But the Holy Spirit's kept it here for us. And there's so many lessons to glean from it. It's a list that should stir up worship. It should remind us to count our blessings because we're prone to forget. It reminds us that there is a king above the 31 kings. And it reminds us that Canaanites' loss was because Israel gained the, count, the kindness and the severity of God. He who has ears to hear, let him hear the word of the Lord tonight. Let's pray. Father God, we, we thank you for your word. Lord, your precious gift to us and your revelation. We thank you for the instructions, the lessons, and the truths that are contained within it. All of it is truth. But we thank you for what you apply to our hearts. We thank you that you remind us. Lord, we want to... For those of us who do belong to Christ, we ask for your forgiveness for the many blessings that we overlook, that we, we don't think enough on Christ's victory for us, and we don't see the many promises fulfilled in our lives every single day. Help us to be mindful. Help us to count our blessings, to name them one by one. Help us to do this, that we may always be able to sing, Great is thy faithfulness, Lord God to me. And I pray for those tonight who, are, who may be unsettled, who do not know you. They may have an intellectual knowledge, but who do not belong to you. I pray for them, O oh God, that they would see the destination that they are heading to. And God, may you cause them to take refuge in Christ. You will not cast any away who come. So Lord God, we pray these things. We thank you for our time. And now we pray even as this song is sung, Lord, that you would enrich our hearts. And as we go from here, may you bless our fellowship, bless our discussion. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.